Um, what is this? So this is Lean Logic uh, by my late friend and mentor, David Fleming, um, who was uh, one of the great inspirations behind the transition movement, was involved in the founding of the New Economics Foundation, was a former chair of the Soil Association, uh, was involved in starting the Green Party in this country. Um, and this was really his life's work. He worked on this book for 30 years um, and didn't quite complete it before his very sudden death at the end of 2010. Uh, and so in the aftermath of his death, um, we talked to some publishers and they were like, well, it is an amazing book, but it's quite large. It's 350,000 words and it's in dictionary format, which is very unusual. It's called a, a dictionary for the future and how to survive it. And, uh, and so there was a worry that people might find it a bit daunting, not really know how to get into it. Um, and so they suggested it would be good to have some kind of um, entry point, maybe, uh, which has ended up becoming this paperback, uh, Surviving the Future, Culture, Carnival and Capital in the Aftermath of the Market Economy. Um, and so what this is, uh, the dictionary has a sort of choose-your-own-adventure feel to it. It's sort of like Wikipedia, if you like. There are within each entry there are little stars next to certain words which have their own entry and so you can be reading one and then hear about another and sort of click through to that as it were in, in, in the book um, and you sort of choose your own path through and at the end of each, each entry there are suggestions of other entries that are related in various ways um, and so as he says in the book it's like it's not a book that you read from start to finish it doesn't really have a start or a finish it's more like um, joining a new community or meeting a new group of friends and there's no beginning or end you just meet someone and you get to know them and then they introduce you to someone else and you get to know them and you gradually get to know the story and become part of the story and that's kind of the experience of, of reading this book um, whereas surviving the future the paperback is where I've selected one of those potential paths through the dictionary uh, and turned that into a more conventional read it front to back book as a sort of an easy way in, if you like, and uh, certainly my idea and what I'm hearing from the early readers is that a lot of people, when they've read that, very quickly want to read the full work, um, uh, but all the content in the paperback is drawn from the, uh, the dictionary. And who do you think uh, would uh, gain from reading these books? <laughs> well, they're so wide-ranging. Um, I've literally just done a workshop my first ever workshop talking about these books which have well actually they don't even launch until next week and uh, the format I decided on for the workshop was getting people to call out anything at all you know not necessarily related to the books any topic that they were interested in um, and to be able to find an entry in the dictionary that spoke to that because it's so wide-ranging all-encompassing really um, but I do think there's an underlying vision in David's work, which is um, a recognition that our current society is destroying the, the roots on which it depends, both economically and ecologically, and importantly, culturally. Um, and as you read the dictionary, there's a sort of, it's a very entertaining book, there's a lot of laughs in it, um, but as you read and you find these entertaining entries draw you in, you find that you're sort of having a, a picture drawn of a, of a different way of organising society. Um, actually one with an older heritage. Uh, so David makes the case that the, the market economy has only been around for a couple of hundred years. Um, and before that, humanity was, was fed and watered by a very different kind of economy, which was based on, on community and on culture and on reciprocal obligations and on trust. And uh, he's arguing that as the market economy falls under the weight of its own mathematical impossibilities, its need for un unlimited growth, etc., um, that's going to cease supporting people. And so the only thing that makes sense to do is to rebuild what he calls the informal economy um, so that that's there to catch people in the aftermath. And of course, the informal economy is still the very core of our current society. It's still the basis on which families are run, for example. Nobody charges their child for childcare or for dinner or whatever, the informal economy is still the basis, the core around which everything else happens. Um, but the market economy has pushed it back as far as possible in as many areas as possible. Uh, I mean, a hundred years ago, the idea of paying for childcare was a horrific, offensive idea. Um, now it's very normal. Um, and so, yeah, really, David, he says there's no point in trying to bring down the market economy. There's actually 
the collapse of the market economy is going to be incredibly difficult um, for people and it's going to be an incredibly destructive time, but it is inevitable. Uh, and so what we need to be doing is, is rebuilding the culture with older groups so that it's there to catch us. So uh, at Dark Mountain and, and many other gatherings like this in communities, we, we talk about the need of going back and understanding more ancient myths and, and mm. how we did things before and so on. Then we have modernity that has been with us now for some time and it has its errors and, and so on. But in a new story that is both sort of um, taking the wisdom out of the, the history, but that also makes use of the modernity, because that's what you're talking about now. Mm -hmm. And I, it, maybe I'm a little all over the place now, but it's like, I'm curious of what from the modern trajectory of the modern story is useful for us mm. in the future. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful phrase that um, I actually forget who said it. it was a permaculture teacher who said that um, pre-industrial society was labor intensive. Um, industrial society is incredibly energy intensive in terms of fossil fuels and the like. Uh, and post-industrial society will have to be very design intensive. Um, so we'll have to organize things in such a way that, you know, like the classical example of a forest garden, once something's designed in the right way, then you're getting nature to do what nature does in a way that supports your community. Um, and so I think those understandings and design techniques are something that have developed a lot over the period of modernity, if you like, um, and are tools that are going to be absolutely essential for us going forward because we're not going to have the energy available. We're not going to want to go back to a pre-industrial, you know, manual labour based way of life. Um, and so it's those those insights into systems design, into ecology that we didn't have before that are going to be essential to making do with what's going to be a much degraded ecology um, and a society that's forgotten a lot of the skills of building community and culture that, that we're going to be relying on again. We should ask, yeah, we, um, I'm sorry that we have this thing with the time, but, but because we all want to eat pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Something's a priority. One question then that we have asked now, us, ourselves is... Yeah, we have another 10 minutes. Yeah, but you know, they yeah. might... We can talk more tomorrow or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the question that I want to ask is... is um, I, I'm making an assumption now, but, uh, but it's pretty clear for all of us, I think, that we have all the facts, all the statistics, all mm. the information we need to understand that the way we live isn't sustainable or doesn't work. What is it that makes, it not, makes us not act, this, even though we have all this information? Hmm. Huh. I mean, we do act. In a, in a lot of ways. I mean, we, we are, you know, everything we do is an action, obviously, and we are telling the stories. I often say we cannot not change the world. You know, whatever we do, we'll change the world. Um, and if we live the most, you know, down the line, do what they tell you, don't make any trouble, course of action, then that is the story and that's the future that we're reinforcing and that we're rebuilding. Um, and it can be very scary, very intimidating to try and do something other than that, you know, to try and say, actually, I don't believe in the stories of this culture and, and I, I want to tell something other with that because a lot of the power structures are still in place. We can see that they're going to fall, but they're still there now. Um, and so we're in this weird bind whereby the, the systems that are on the verge of collapse and which we need to disentangle ourselves from are still sufficiently powerful that they are constraining what we can do. Uh, so I was involved in chairing this land cooperative and we had to spend three years battling for permission just to live on the land on small holdings, which is in many ways the most inoffensive thing you could imagine doing. Um, and yet it's so contrary to the assumptions of now that a, a farm can't possibly be sustainable unless it's a minimum of 200 acres. So, you know, the idea that you want to do this on four or five acres is just absurd. You know, what are you even talking about? 
Um, so when those cultural stories and the power structures that back those cultural stories are in place, it takes immense effort to push through the inertia. But what's exciting about that is that as the power structures that are dominant now continue to weaken and struggle and crumble, they're going to constrain us less and less and we're actually going to discover more freedom as things become more difficult. And that's, that's a complicated time, but it's a fascinating time to live. Interesting. In what way does it give us more freedom? Because centralised power, which is what globalisation is to a large extent about, relies on long supply chains. It relies on everything happening in the way that it's expected. It relies on cheap energy being available to allow for all those supply lines to happen. And those things aren't going to be available. So centralised top-down power, you know, we can look at it and say, well, it's undesirable and it's unsustainable. But it's really easy to forget that what unsustainable means is it's going to end. You know, that's what unsustainable means. And as it crumbles, as it moves towards its end, it weakens. And so as those powers are less able to enforce adherence to the dominant stories of our culture, we gain more freedom to do things in the gaps you know it's no longer able to keep an eye on everything because it's weakening because it's crumbling um, and that opens up more freedom and sometimes we can we have to be careful that we're not um, imprisoned by cages that aren't there anymore um, I mean there are st horrible stories of um, dogs that are kept in tiny cages that they pass electricity through the bars of the cage and the dog is shocked and the first time it's shocked it fights and tries to get out but it can't because it's in this tiny cage and it's shocked again and it fights and it fights and it's shocked again and eventually it just gives up and it's just lying there being shocked and it knows it can't do anything and then they open the cage and they shock it and it still just lies there because it's just learned helplessness and we have to be very careful that we don't learn helplessness that yes maybe we try something and we get slapped down and we try something and we get slapped down but those structures are weakening. You know, that's what unsustainable means. They are unsustainable and they're weakening. And keep trying because sooner or later you'll find that you push on something and the guard that you assumed was there actually isn't there anymore. You know, there's a security camera watching you but there's no one sitting behind it. And don't let those constraints become internalised. Keep doing, telling the story you want to tell with your lives. And if you have to fight against people trying to stop you doing it, fight them but eventually what's life for life is for telling a story that you believe in with your life and if you stop doing that because you think you can't make it happen then you're not living the story of your life anymore i think that is i mean that is why what we need to do right to act yeah to tell tell the story that makes sense to us. And that will look different for everybody. You know, for someone that'll be tending my little piece of land and, and, and doing what I can to heal that. For some people, it'll be, be trying to change the economic structures of the world. For some people, it'll be telling beautiful stories around a campfire, you know, whatever it may be. But only we can know as, as, as individuals and as communities what story fills us with delight, what story we would be proud to tell on our deathbed. You know, this is what I did with my life. And even in a, you know, a hopeless scenario, like take climate change. Um, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time working on climate change, writing some popular writings about explaining climate change to people, working with climate scientists. I find it very hard now to convince myself that there's a scenario in which we don't run, go into runaway destabilization of our climate. I think that's, the die is cast on that now. But I think it's worrying to me that a lot of people seem to think, well, that's the end then. You know, that's the end of the story. Well, no, because life inherently is unsustainable. We all die. We know that. That's the one certainty of life. We're all going to die. And even the universe, according to the latest science, will die. You know, in heat death, the sun will burn out. You know, sustainability ultimately is unachievable. And if we make sustainability our God, then we will fail our God. Um... So let's not pretend that what we're trying to achieve is something ultimately sustainable. And let's not pretend that because something isn't sustainable, it's meaningless. What's important in a life is not sustaining it forever because that's impossible. What's important in a life, I believe, is telling a story that you believe in, that you're proud to tell with your life and that you can look back on your deathbed and smile. 
And there is absolutely nothing in this world that stops us from doing that in the current circumstance. And you know, last night I was out sitting around a, a truck that's been converted into a, a travelling performance space um, with Rima Staines and Tom Irons. And they, I know they crowdfunded that. I was involved in supporting their crowdfunder. And it's beautiful. It was so amazing to be sitting there with a couple of people who you can see are telling the story they want to tell with their lives. And it's inspiring. It makes everyone around them want to do the same thing. And maybe we're living in a time of unstoppable runaway climate change. That hasn't stopped that story being told. That hasn't stopped that story being important. So don't get distracted by the fact that something can't last forever from the fact that its existence is meaningful.